I'm Ian Pereira, and I just want to welcome you all today. I hope you're getting your breakfast and uh, an early start to the, uh, to the conference. And today's topic is mild traumatic brain injury. This is uh, one that is very near and dear to my heart because it's a traumatic brain injury that essentially ended my career in emergency medicine. So um, a few years ago, I was uh, crossing the street after dropping my kids off and uh, I got hit by a car and had a TBI. And it, the impact it had on my life has really led me to explore a little bit more into this space. So I'm delighted to be able to join you and uh, our awesome panelists uh, as we uh, learn a bit more today. So my disclosures, I have not yet received my uh, check from Big Pharma for all the work I did in doing COVID vaccination, but I understand that that's coming from my Twitter feed. Um, and uh, I'm the chief of staff at Joseph Brand Hospital. And financial support, the program has received educational grants from Abbott, uh, but, uh, and the speakers are eligible for an honorarium, cool, from, uh, from Kate. And the slide on mitigating potential bias, we've done many things. So our faculty today is me. I'm an eMERGE doc, or used to be, uh, from Burlington. And uh, I'm the Vice President of the College of Physicians of Ontario and the Chair of the Ontario Hospital Association's uh, Physician Leadership Network. Uh, I'm also, unfortunately, uh, one of the team eMERGE docs for the Toronto Maple Leafs. But I am confident that uh, next year is, uh, is going to be our year. Uh, also uh, with me to guide us on this journey of discovery uh, about traumatic brain injury is Catherine Varner. Catherine's an emergency physician in Mount Sinai in Toronto and an associate professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at U of T. She's deputy director and a clinician scientist at the schwartz Reisman Emergency Medicine Institute. She has two areas of research focus, uh, mild traumatic brain injury and pregnancy care in the emergency department. And Sunil, who many of you will know, uh, is an associate professor of emergency medicine and HRM, evidence and impact at McMaster. He completed his Royal College uh, Emerge training in 2001 at McMaster uh, and his master's in HEI in 2005. He's the co-founder of BEAM uh, and is the former standards chair for CAPE and the Royal College EM examiner. He's the inaugural research lead for the EM researchers of Niagara um, which uh, has been prolific in their academic output since he's uh, taken the helm. And he's also a methodologist for the Society of, well, this goes on and on, et cetera, et cetera. So Sunil does lots of uh, cool things. I can't believe your mom wrote that whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of spelling corrections. Yeah. Yeah. So today I think there are many questions around TBI in the eMERGE and what to do, what's right, what's wrong, what ought to we do? And, you know, from my personal experience, I can say this is a space where we can do better. Um, you know, when I was training, there was a lot of CT head normal, you're not playing sports, go home. And I think it fails to recognize so many of the nuances of providing TBI care and the real sequelae that patients and their families face uh, once they're discharged from our ED and out of our purview. So we do want to talk about the epidemiology of uh, ED TBI. Um, and apply the Choosing Wisely Emergency Medicine Framework uh, for imaging decisions using validated clinical decision rules. And, and really, and this is also a really important one, is diagnosing and managing um, TBIs in vulnerable populations. You know, I think we do pretty well with kids who get hurt playing sports, and we do pretty well with people with catastrophic brain injuries that need intervention. And, uh, and I think there is a gap in both how we follow up patients and how we instruct them to access resources in the community to make sure that they can have a full, complete recovery. So it's gonna be a really interesting session, and with that, I will hand it over to Sunil. Thanks, Ian, for the generous introduction. Thanks, Kate, for inviting us here today, myself and Catherine stuff. I'm excited to be here because I'm kind of really keen to hear about the work Catherine and her group's been doing, so I'm happy to be here opening act for this. Uh, disclosures are here, like I said, I've had some research activities, some of which is funded through CAPE and what have you, uh, working with BEAM and program and the SAEM's guidelines group, the last one of which just came out last week on dizziness and vertigo. It's a long, complicated read, but evidently there's some useful information in there. If you want to read about it, we can talk about that another day. And uh, I curate a website also for uh, emergency medicine guidelines summary, so you don't have to read these long, monstrous documents, and I summarize them in one or two pages and hopefully make it more digestible for emergency physicians worldwide. 
what I will try and cover in the talk, I'm going to do a State of the Union address, as it were, in terms of where things have been recently and where things are landing in terms of guidance and um, standards of care if we sort of use that frame poorly. Um, what are the challenges with nomenclature and definitions for minor traumatic brain injury? Uh, CT scanning and how to reduce them effectively, safely, and still serve our patient populations well. Uh, Sam and a bunch of us who work on the Cape Choosing Wisely Canada group have addressed this, and there's an update just coming probably in CGM soon, I assume, we just accepted for revisions for the minor traumatic brain injury uh, recommendations, and stay tuned on that. And then hot off for us, ASAP has just put out a clinical policy a few weeks ago, so it was the timing of this couldn't work better. So we'll go through the recommendations of that. So what are the paradigms? Well, let's talk about it for a couple uh, cases here, okay? So let's start with a 55-year-old drummer for Docs That Rock who falls off his drum stool yesterday uh, during rehearsal, cuts his head, gets lacerated. Otherwise, he's fine. He should be okay to perform tomorrow night um, on aspirin, some other cardiovascular medications, but otherwise uh, nothing major, normal neurological exam. The scalp is lacerated. It is repaired. So does our erstwhile drummer need a scan or not? So you can decide amongst yourselves, yes or no, based on that information. Second scenario, let's make it a little. Six-year-old kid falls off the monkey bars at the playground, hits his head on the ground, seems woozy for a minute, the eyes roll back in the head. That's one of my favorite descriptors because I don't know what to do with that. Some jerky movements. Uh, now back to normal, approximately three hours after the injury, complains of a little headache, has a small scalp hematoma, normal physical exam, neurological exam, no evidence of abuse and neglect, stable home to go to for discharge upon evaluation of the ED, and they can come back. So safe to go home. So would you image this kid or not? Internal decision, yes or no? Think about that. Okay? So what's the epidemiology in Canada of traumatic brain injury? So Public Health Agency in Canada a couple years ago uh, did a summary review of this, which is uh, timely. So over a 14-year period, 240-some-odd trauma deaths, 23% of a quarter of them about from head injury and mostly amongst the elderly over 65 years old, and we'll hear more about that from Catherine later. Uh, similar time window, about 15 years. In terms of visits to the emergency department, 5 million over that period. Mostly falls in the elderly and then sports and recreation from children and adolescents. Hockey is the number one sport amongst the younger groups that causes head injuries and then rugby, the motor vehicle accidents and whatnot. All right. So that's the state of affairs in Canada. Sorry about the business of slides. I tried to cut this out. There's a couple little stories here that are useful. So over different age groups and time periods, you can see that accidental, well, emergency visits are from assaults happen in uh, younger teens and older teens, both in males and females. However, hospitalizations, there's quite a striking difference. On the female side, top right, it's in infants, and on the male side, it seems to be in the elderly. So that's quite the split. But in the middle years for injuries for uh, just ED visits, they're the same. So that was a curious finding. Ian, Ian brought up concussions in sport. This is a big deal. Um, it, it's a common thing. Uh, the latest international consensus uh, story on this from 2017 is it's a sports injury causing biomechanical forces to the face and the head, resulting in, in short-lived impairment of neurological function. There are different definitions of this that we're going to see, and it, there are similarities, but there are differences, and that causes a little bit of trouble. So in Ontario, the tragedy is with Rowan Stringer a few years back, a rugby player who went back too many times too quickly uh, and ended up dying from complications of repetitive head trauma too soon after the fact and resulted in Rowan's law. Uh, requiring mandatory screening and periods of rest for athletes uh, in concussion. So other epidemiological things, this is again from the, U the U.S. Uh, policy that was just published right now. Majority of adults they see in the, in the state's population is adults with an unintentional falls. And again, in the 75-year-old population, the vulnerable elderly, a third of them roughly end up hospitalized. No, almost a third of them end up dying from their traumatic brain injuries. 90% of the stuff we see in the ER, and majority of those are the ones we send home. But again, 5 to 15% stateside get admitted, and the death rate in this lesser risk population is a lot less, so that's some, some epidemiological numbers from the state. So one of the troubles, again, is how do you define the minor traumatic brain injury? And you know, nomenclature has evolved and changed over the years, and again, it's, it's, this is from Ontario no no Trauma Foundation. Again, similarities and differences. Acute neurological physiological events from blunt tip act or other mechanical injuries to the head, not your body, causing disruptions in function. 
uh, motor vehicle accidents like Ian's story here, we, we've heard about sports, recreation, and children, falls, workplace injury, the mechanisms are, don't really matter. The head doesn't know why it's being injured, it just knows it's been injured. So there are populations at risk that merit paying attention to historically and future forward. Um, the same problems exist in many other types of medicine that here, uh, race and gender, are dis they're disparities. You know, um, non-whites versus whites are treated differently. Women and victims of uh, intimate personal violence and domestic violence are treated differently than uh, others. Children are vulnerable because they're at more risk for non-accidental injury abuse stuff, so you just have to have your radar on for those types of things. Uh, the elderly and those who are antiquated have been historically a challenging population who generally get auto-scanned, but that might be changing soon. More from Catherine on that in a bit. Left without being seen, there is a literature on this of patients who have head injuries who leave uh, without being seen and assessed and or imaged from uh, the ER and leading to adverse outcomes. It's not a big literature, but there is some stuff out there, so you gotta be mindful of that. Uh, athletes, again, with the mechanism of injuries and also with return to sport guidance, which we heard about from Rowan's Law, those are all populations that merit some attention or special attention. So who to image? Who are we gonna scan? Are we gonna scan our drummer? Are we gonna scan our little kid falling off the monkey bars? So in those two cases. So in Canada, there is plenty of evidence that physicians over-test and over-treat on a million different things. There was a systematic review on this in CMAJ that was quite well done, quite comprehensive uh, last year. Uh, 175 studies, about a third of them sucked. Um, however, the, there is a story there that is consistent, notwithstanding methodological issues, of inappropriate practices both on the diagnostic side and therapeutic side in about a third of the cases, low value diagnostic tests a third of the time, and low value head imaging in minor traumatic brain injury of various definitions about a third of the time. Going into the paper, you can't, it's not as easy to tell which ones are ER based or not, but you can probably guess that a substantial proportion of some of these low value head imaging studies are ER based, okay? This just makes sense where we're at. So, okay, we scan a lot or a third of the time perhaps scanning inappropriate. Let's just pretend that that's the baseline of what we all do. Is there a risk to this? Yes, there is. So again, systematic review looking at bigs, so adults, okay? So this was from last year, CT scan, the risk of cancer, okay? Because this is the big uh, boogeyman in the room, as it were. So, from the studies pooled here, 25 of which, with 111 million scans studied worldwide in history, okay? The lifetime attributable risk and the actual odds ratio for adult to get cancer from CT scans was about 5.8. It is increased with dose and with the number of sites scanned, and again, you can imagine with repeat CTs as well, the more you get irradiated, the more likely your risk of cancer is gonna be. It seems that there's more solid malignancies rather than leukemias in the adult populations, and there's no differences based on age, gender, uh, geographic region of the world, the quality scores of the studies, you know, when you looked at the scan rates versus the, um, the cancer outcome. So there is a there there. Like how you parse this out and what you think the actual numbers are for the odds ratios, it doesn't really matter, but there is a signal here that, again, low value scanning will lead to potentially bad outcomes in the future on, for adults with cancer. So the littles, so the kids. Uh, is the risk there. So this was a case-controlled study, so not as strong as the systematic review that we saw uh, in the previous slide uh, in CMHA last year. So blood-borne malignancies and intracranial tumors of littles who get uh, irradiated for whatever reason. A single scan, reassuringly, was of no increased risk. But once you got into four or more, uh, the incremental risk ratio went up. So 1.4 to 3.7 uh, risk. Um, again, the little littles, so kids under four, so under six, sorry, with four or more scans in their lifetime for whatever reason, uh, were at much higher risk of children who had four or more scans in age seven to 12 and then following by 13 to 18. Presumably because their tissues are still in a very highly developmental stage and uh, prone to an irradiation injury risk. So that's a thing. So again, you don't want to scan the kids if you, don't, if you can avoid it. Um, can you reduce CT usage? Yes, Corey Dunn and the team out of Calgary last year did this one in Annals Emergency Medicine System Review, and we uh, reviewed it in our uh, BEAM program. 
150 studies included looking at about 15 single strategies to reduce CT usage in emergency departments and 11 multimodal interventions. What were the most effective things? Integrating CT decision making into diagnostic pathways, offering alternative tests, maybe getting specialists involved, although personally I'm and I have a bit of an anathema about begging permission from other specialists to do CTs, but whatever. And uh, provider audit and feedbacks um, using presumably quality improvements metrics which weren't necessarily listed in this paper, but I'd be curious to see what those were. What didn't work or was less effective was talking to families, uh, patients and uh, parents or whatever about the need to avoid CTs. Uh, computerized decision support, that was a bit surprising to me. I thought if it was integrated into EHRs and stuff, it might assist, but it doesn't seem that there's a big signal for that. And just passive guideline recommendation dissemination, like publish some big monster like we did with Grace last week, and then pray to God that the eMERGE population reads them and takes them and integrates them into practice. That doesn't work. You need implementation strategies for that. Anyway, so that's what uh, Team Calgary found out last year. So as mentioned, uh, myself, Sam, uh, various other people in the group here, we work with the Cape Choosing Wisely group for the last five years. Uh, this was spearheaded with Amy Cheng and Brian Rowe, who got a bunch of us to sit around, come up with our top five list of things that you should avoid in terms of low value uh, imaging, sort of low value testing and treatments, both, that we, so we, and that was expanded to 10 in the 2019 list. So there's six recommendations around low value diagnostic imaging and four around antibiotic stewardship. And again, that's being updated now on the medical, on the minor TBI in, injury screening. So this was the recommendation that was initially there. So use a clinical decision rule, okay? With the bigs, use uh, one, and with the little, use the other ones, right? So we'll go through those. So which rules are we gonna see? Pediatrics, the two bigs ones that are out there are CATCH and PCARN. CATCH is the Canadian rule that Martin Osmond and his group came up with some years back. PCARN is the American one. Um, Adult, let's just cut to the chase. We're going to only to mention this Canadian CT head rule, and we're not going to, we're going to ignore everything else because they just don't perform, okay? Much to the chagrin of our American partners. Um, if you're a tech guy, tech person, you can get these things on MedCalc or whatever, so they're there. Just put them in your favorites list and click them and use them and then put document on your chart that you did the score, and there it is. Some people print these out and put them on the chart, which is shocking to me, whatever, if you, whatever floats your boat. Uh, but you can do that, okay? So P let's cut with the littles. So P Carn versus Catch, been compared a few times in the literature. I'm not gonna pretend to be a peds head injury expert, but the latest one on this was uh, this article from last year. Uh, I'm just gonna take you to the punchline. Under 24 hours, P Carn performed very well from sensitivity to rule out abnormal CT requiring a neurosurgical intervention. So 96% sensitive with a lower confidence, so a margin of almost 92%, so less than a 10% miss rate, which for most eMERGE docs in the literature would be accepted, okay? After 24 hours, it drops to 85%, so that would probably not be accepted in terms of a miss rate, especially with a lower margin of confidence interval of 42%. CATCH did not perform quite the same 92% overall, but as low as 86% under 24 hours, and then was not as useful, again, after uh, greater than 24 hours, again, with nearly identical numbers, which is surprising. However, both rules did perform absolutely perfectly for predicting the need for a neurosurgical intervention, both below, under 24 hours, and after 24 hours. So you could justify using both, okay? Little caveats, again, with both. PCARN misclassified less than half a percent of uh, kids who sh should not have got a CT who ultimately did end up with a neurosurgical, so, uh, an intracranial injury not requiring neurosurgery. Catch was about 1% miss rate, uh, again with a missed injury on CT, but neither of them had deaths and neither of them needed neurosurgical intervention. So it, again, not so much. So overall, if you're gonna lean one way or the other, I apologize to Team Ottawa and Martin's group in Chio, but it seems PCARN may be a little better or more discriminating under 24 hours, but you could use both safely. Is Martin or Janet here? Anybody here? Like, I don't want to piss them off. Yeah. Anyway, good. Fine. Okay. So, well, let's uh, bring this home for my part on the, the newest ASEP guidance with their clinical policies. Uh, funded by ASEP, no conflict of interest amongst the authors. Uh, they, the, I mean, our, the target audience for these policies are emergency physicians who practice mostly in the States, actually. The inclusion were adults with blunt uh, traumatic brain injury for questions one and two, and then those who've been already diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury and concussion for question three. We'll just go through those all in a second. Exclusions are the usuals, bleeding disorders, pregnant, pediatric, primary seizure disorders, traumas, unstable vital signs with multi-system trauma, so that's predictable. These aren't minor injuries. 
okay? So question one was, in adults with a minor traumatic brain injury, which rule do you use? Let's just cut to the chase. It's the Canadian one, okay? Uh, if Ian or Team Ottawa is here, I'm sure they'll be very happy to hear that, that the Americans have finally caught on, like the rest of the world, that the Canadian rules are better. Okay, level B, you can, you can use the Nexus rule or the New Orleans criteria, but they don't perform as well and they do, uh, from a specificity perspective, and they lead to more overtesting and cost uh, overruns, in the, which is a problem in the States. Level C, this may change in the next five minutes, so stay tuned. Uh, don't use these CT rules or whatever for adults uh, who are elderly and or anticoagulated. Five minutes, so stay tuned. Anyway, so here are the rules just in case, and like I said, I've highlighted those areas which historically have been exclusions for the use of the rule and now may change in the next few minutes. Okay, so uh, question two, in adults who are anticoagulated or what have you with uh, antiplatelet age, normal neurological time, and they've already had a single CT, are they safe to go home? I don't know why this is a question in the rest of the world, but evidently in America, if you've done all of these things and scanned them once, you might still keep them around and scan them again. That's not a Canadian practice anywhere I know. Anyway, level A level evidence, there was none. Level B recommendations, but there's no, no need for repeat imaging or to routinely admit them for ongoing observations once you've scanned them once. This, I think, is standard in Canada anyway. Level C, give them discharge instructions just in case they have some symptoms that merit a return to the ER and perhaps a, re a repeat scan. Okay. So that one's a bit of an odd one in the Canadian context in my mind. Question three, for those patients who have been diagnosed now with a concussion, are there clinical decision rules and factors for follow-up for post-concussive syndrome? Uh, Ian may be able to speak to that from personal experience better, or de uh, delayed sequelae after ER discharge. Level A and B evidence, there's none. Level C recommendation is if there's risk factors for post-concussive syndrome, uh, female, prior psychiatric history, GCS less than 15 on arrival, assaults, injuries of that nature, pre-injury, mood disorders, then perhaps that's a patient who may merit a follow-up with a neurologist or a concussion clinic if such services are available to you. Uh, valid decision rules for this population, there are none. Biomarkers of any utility for diagnostic practice, there are none, okay? Not yet. Stay tuned, perhaps in the future there might be. But there's been a lot of pretenders, but there's no real contenders uh, for a blood test or some serum marker for traumatic brain injury at this time. Uh, and then, if, again, if you're going to follow, if you're going to give appropriate discharge instruction sheets and referrals to whatever clinics you want to use, go ahead and do so. So I will pass off now to Catherine, and then we can hear about the latest stuff, about how this will change on some of the things that uh, I said we can't do yet. Thanks so much, Sunil. It's so great to be here at CAPE with all of you, and uh, it's great to uh, be talking about head injuries and a patient population whom we see frequently in the emergency department. And uh, these are my disclosures. And one of the things not included in this slide is uh, I'm a member of the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation Guidelines Committee on mild traumatic brain injury diagnosis and management. And one of the things I've tried to bring to the table is the emergency department perspective um, in making sure that the guidelines really reflect what we do and the patients whom we see in the emergency department. I'm gonna start with a case. This is a case that I'm sure that you saw on your last shift. This is an 80-year-old female who comes to the emergency department from an assisted living facility. She was on her way to get breakfast, and the carpet had a bit of a bump in it, and she tripped over it. It was a witness fall. She remembers the entirety of the events. She doesn't think she hit her head. She feels well, neurologically intact. She's fairly well at her baseline, but the assisted living facility sent her into your department to get checked out. I know I saw this patient yesterday on my, on my emergency department shift, and I'm sure that you did too. But the challenge to this patient population is that we have not yet had a clinical decision rule to inform what to do with respect to scanning. The Canadian head CT rules did not include this patient population as part of its derivation or validation processes. And so we need, desperately, a clinical decision rule to help with this patient population because these patients account for 3% of emergency department visits in Canada. 3% doesn't sound like a large number, but when you look at what happens to these patients in the emergency department, if you have a CT done, it prolongs their length of stay substantially. And for rural providers, it means that you may have to ship this person somewhere else to have a CT done. 
And the older patient population, especially now and it's crowding, having them sit in a chair for hours upon hours waiting for a head CT actually puts them at potentially some risk. Do they risk falling in your department? Do they risk developing delirium amidst this milieu of chaos? So I would argue that having a clinical decision rule for this 3% patient population would really change our practice. And so let's look and see what's happened. One of our great researchers of Canadian emergency medicine, Dr. Kirsten DeWitt, who I see back in the, uh, the back there, um, spent the last several years leading a project to develop a clinical decision rule to exclude clinically important intracranial bleeding in older adults who present to the emergency department through fall. So Dr. DeWitt gave you permission to speak to uh, the results of this, this study. She is presenting tomorrow. This was an award-winning study uh, by the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine and is essentially hot off the press. So I'm, I'm quite uh, pleased and honored to be able to share some of the results of this study with you. This rule applies to the patients who are aged 65 years and older, who present to your emergency department, who fall from standing height or from an equivalent height. They slipped off the bed. They fell off the toilet. These are not patients who fell down the stairs. These are older adults who fall from standing height. If the patient did not hit their head, remembers the fall, has no neurologic changes on their exam, and they're not living with frailty, or they're considered living with very mild frailty, and we'll talk about what that means as per the clinical frailty scale, these patients do not need a head CT. And I'm gonna go through this again, because I know you all are eating breakfast, so we'll talk a bit about it again. But let's talk first about the clinical frailty scale. I have not committed this scale to memory. I've not kept it on my phone, but I will as of today, because I know that using this clinical decision rule potentially is going to decrease the number of scans that I'm doing in my practice. This is available on MedCalc, and it's worth it to me to have the utility of this clinical decision rule in my practice. I think it's gonna change my practice potentially every single day. So the clinical frailty scale is uh, a scale that we know that emergency departments, or emergency physicians and emergency providers can use and, and apply well to their patients that are presenting to the ED. If you have a clinical frailty scale of less than five, then these patients qualify for the clinical decision rule uh, for the FALLS tool. This rule has excellent test characteristics. So if the patient, and I'm gonna repeat it again, so 65 years and older, has a fall from standing height, full recollection of the events, didn't hit their head, no neuro neurologic features, and a clinical frailty scale of less than five, you can be very sure that this patient does not have an intracranial bleed, and they do not need a head CT. Now, the investigators, Dr. DeWitt and her team, knew that emergency physicians like things simple. So they wanted to see what would happen if you took the clinical frailty scale out. If you took the, uh, whether or not the patient remembered the, the event out. Well, it decreased some of the predictive ability of the score. And so I would argue that we should be using the FALLS rule with the clinical frailty scale. In my mind, I think we are one step closer to having a clinical decision rule that can help us with this huge patient population that is growing and we are seeing on a much more frequent basis. And I look forward to the next steps, which is the prospective validation of this study. So, Let's return to this case again one more time because I think it's important to review it again. This is a patient who has a clinical frailty scale of four, so less than five. She remembers the events. She didn't hit her head. She's at her neurologic baseline. This patient does not need a head CT and she can be sent home. Maybe I didn't mention that this patient was also on a DOAC. Did I forget? No. 
because when they did the prospective derivation of this study, and they shook the box of all of the risk factors of intracranial bleeding, DOAX and anticoagulants didn't come out as a risk factor for this patient population. And so, and I'm going to describe in a bit more detail why this might be, but for this patient, it doesn't change what we do, even if she's on a DOAC. That's practice changing. Dr. Graywall is sitting here in the front of the audience, also one of our Canadian superstar emergency physician researchers. This speaks, this study that I'm going to present to you speaks to why anticoagulants may not be as high risk as we think that they are. So this was a study published in the CMAJ in 2021 that evaluated the risk of intracranial hemorrhage in the emergency department for patients who are presenting 65 years and older, so our older patient population, comparing DOAX to warfarin to patients who are not on anticoagulants at all. They looked for the primary outcome of intracranial hemorrhage, and then they also evaluated risk of neurosurgical intervention and risk of mortality at 30 days. This was an ICES study, so a large administrative database based in Ontario, almost 80,000 patients, so very well-powered study, to look um, for the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. About 12% were on DOAX, 5% were on Coumadin, and 6% roughly of these patients had an intracranial hemorrhage diagnosed at that emergency department visit. This is busy, so I'm going to share with you that warfarin as compared to DOAX, as compared to no anticoagulants, increase the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. DOAX as compared to no anticoagulants were roughly the same. In patients um, who are on Coumadin, they had a higher risk of neurosurgical intervention, but all of the groups had about the same risk of mortality at 30 days. So based on this work, it tells us a bit more as to why, when they were deriving the FALS clinical decision rule, that these patients on anticoagulants did not have a substantially higher risk to intracranial hemorrhage. I suspect it's that there were not a, a large number of patients on Coumadin as part of the derivation of the FALS clinical decision rule. So I, mil I knowing that these patients are at higher risk, I'm going to have some pause about applying the false clinical decision rule in a patient who is on warfarin, possibly. Patients are on, who are on DOAX, I'm going to have less concern about them, certainly if they have the clinical features of the false clinical decision rule. So let's apply the evidence to this case to one, one more time. This was a patient who's 80 years old, so 65 years and older. She had a fall from standing height. She fell. It was a witness fall. She remembers falling. She did not hit her head. She has no new neurologic findings, and her clinical frailty scale is less than five. Even though she's on a DOAC, she does not need a head CT. There's really not good evidence to suggest that we need to start holding our patients' medications after they've fallen, their anticoagulants after they've fallen. This is a, an area that does need a bit more research. So are there groups that we need to be holding medications like anticoagulants in after they've fallen? Maybe for the group on Coumadin, but there's really not good evidence to support that. We certainly don't need to be holding these patients for repeat scans. And I don't think that's something that we generally are doing in clinical practice in Canada. So what's next? I'm excited that the future holds a collaboration of these two awesome investigators. I think we're really fortunate to be leading internationally the future of clinical decision rules in this space, because I think it is truly practice changing especially as we're facing crowding in our emergency departments, especially as we're facing an older, uh, 
patient population and an aging population. And so the future is happening now in centers across Canada. We are in the process of developing a selective head CT clinical decision rule in patients who are anticoagulated in the emergency department. And I do look forward to hearing more about this work from our stellar researchers in the next few years at CAPE. So just to summarize all of the points, the definition of mild traumatic brain injury is certainly evolving. The Canadian Head C2 rule, what a superstar team several years back, decades back now, uh, who developed that rule, we're grateful for the work that they've done. And pediatrics, PCARN seems to be the superior rule to catch. Coumadin is still the anticoagulant, certainly of my concern, and it should be yours as well, but not necessarily DOAX. And I look forward to applying on my next shift the Falls Clinical Decision Rule, understanding that it's not yet been validated, but I look forward to the future of that work. Thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to Ian. I don't really know what this slide is about, whom to follow. Follow Canadian rules. Uh, follow the rules. Canadian rules. Oh, I gotta go back. So, you know, one of the things I love to see in a presentation is people doing this, because it means that there's something on the screen there that they're taking away that they're gonna incorporate into their practice. And it's something that they've identified where they can do better for patients and their families to improve their outcome but also as stewards of the healthcare system to use these scarce healthcare resources that we have in the way that best benefits um, uh, populations. So it's really terrific, unless you were taking pictures of Sunil, which also happens, he's available to autograph them after the session. So um, i happy to take any questions for uh, either of the panelists. The microphones are on either side. Everyone is in a, like a bacon-induced coma for the first session. Usually this is what I expect for like the Tuesday morning session. Um, so maybe, maybe one question that, that did come up is who to follow. And um, you know, I think one of the challenges in emergency medicine for me is that you'll see so many patients with minor traumatic brain injuries and they seem all right. And you know, it's okay, you're gonna be all right, follow up with your family physician. And there's really good evidence that about 30, 40% of these patients will go on to have lasting sequelae from their TBI beyond uh, two weeks. And so um, I think one of the things that you can do in your, uh, your own practice setting is identify a network uh, in the community where you can follow up these folks, especially those uh, who don't have a family physician or whose family physician may not feel comfortable. Um, managing these patients and one of the things we're doing here in the GTA is trying to create such a network uh, where people are connected to local resources to have assessments uh, after a couple of days and it's been very successful in identifying a pretty big group of patients who end up ne needing uh, further follow-up especially those who have mental health concerns um, after their injuries so that I think has been really fruitful hey thanks for that talk this morning uh, that was really insightful I'm wondering if you guys had any insights um, related to, there's a group in Scandinavia that has the Scandinavian um, CT head rules that are specifically designed for minimal head injury. Um, I'm wondering if there is any sort of collaboration or thought um, around that, because a lot of this work has sort of been uh, done by them as well, and um, any thoughts about that? Scandinavian, sorry, are we live? Okay. Yeah, so a there's, a, there's a group um, out of Scandinavia and they have uh, a decision rule for patients who've had minimal head injuries specifically uh, called the Scandinavian guidelines. Um, some of them are quite intuitive things that we probably already incorporate into our practice already, um, but they have a guideline on this as well. I personally don't have any familiarity with it. It hasn't penetrated, to my knowledge, up to a, uh, a level two or a level one rule for sure, because otherwise we would have heard about this, right? Um, it hasn't been addressed in any guidance documents, to my knowledge, or any at least prospective implementation studies or systematic reason meta-analyses for our populations. So I don't think, Catherine, do you have a thought? 
You said it has some motherhood and apple pie type of stuff in it? Though? Sorry, say that again? You, it has some like common intuitive motherhood and apple pie, like you've yeah, been hit in like, the head, you might have a head yeah, injury, like that kind of thing. Really high risk you things know, that trauma you above the get. clavicles, like yeah. that. Yeah, um, and you know, like things that you would probably scan anyways, but they yeah. suggest not scanning when there are high risk features. I can't remember the exact rule off the top of my I head. I have to check into it, but uh, I, I suspect but yeah, if it has sure. overlap with the Canadian rule, again, the Canadian rule has performed very well. Uh, in the appropriate populations repeatedly over many years, and it has achieved level one status, which is you know, prospective validation in multiple settings in a worldwide uh, environment with evidence of uh, proven benefit on resource reduction and cost savings. That's the definition of a level one CDR, and that's the gold standard, and the, the, C the Canadian CT who rule, CT head rule achieves that. No other rule, to my knowledge, achieves that. Thanks. Uh, I think a, a super cool corollary to what we heard today, though, is the opportunity for non-emergency physicians to apply decision rules before they make the choice to send a patient, especially from, say, a nursing home, to the emergency department for assessment. I think there's a huge opportunity there. And um, so it is something that, while we're at a conference of emergency physicians, it, it would be very helpful to promulgate this information to primary care physicians working in that space. I would, I would also say paramedics. I, yeah. I know there are paramedics here with us today, and um, the, op the, the ability to apply the clinical decision rule in the paramedicine setting would also be you know, quite practice changing. Good morning. Thank you very much again for a great talk. Uh, two questions I actually have for you. First is, uh, just recently new for me anyways, was the five Ps um, decision rule in terms of, not necessarily about scanning, but in terms of predicting some of those longer term uh, post-concussive symptoms. Um, it was kind of new to me, sounds like it has kind of great pedigree behind it, but just wondering about any comment on the five Ps from, from you guys. And then the second was, I know that you alluded a little bit to kind of the difficulties in nomenclature between mild TBI and concussion. Do you differentiate between the two and you know what importance is there? So. Uh so I will point out, this is a fee-for-service conference, so you're only allowed one question per visit. <laughs> Can I book for tomorrow? Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'll take on the second question first about the differences in nomenclature. Uh, intuitively, there's overlap between the words minor traumatic brain injury and the, the word concussion and the implications thereof. Uh, the usage of this terminology in different arenas matters though. In sports and return to, to activity, there are consequences of certain definitions and subtle differences between them. Uh, medical legally, I suspect there would be some as well. I'm not an expert in medical legal stuff. I did look on CMPA's website, as I do for all of these types of talks, to see if there was any case literature or summary documents um, on the CMPA website around ER head injury stuff, and there actually wasn't very much there which is interesting. So language does matter. How is probably hair splitting, depending on the organization you're dealing with and the consequences of the decisions and they're making and the policies that they're implementing for their populations of interest. The first one on the five Ps, for that's a CDR for who needs follow-up for uh, concussion follow-up. Not familiar with it at all. It wasn't addressed in any of the policies or systematic review documents that I looked at for this talk. I don't know, Catherine, if you're familiar with any. No, but I'd love to hear them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the consequence of that, such a tool, though, is if, if somebody's screen positive, presumably you would want a resource to then send them to. And if you don't have that, then what does it matter? It's the, the axiomatic is if it doesn't change your outcome, don't do the test. We've Which, looked at um, risk factors for uh, post concussion syndromes, and the ones that consistently have come out are assault. Um, psychiatric conditions that precede uh, the head injury, and there has been um, workplace injuries also have been associated with increased risk. But there's a, a variety of different studies that have looked at, at risk factors, which I su suspect has informed the five Ps. Um, but um, can you sh can you share them quickly with us? I, so uh, as I said, they're, it's new to me, so I can't say I have them all committed to memory. Um, and I believe it's actually specifically in the pediatric population. Um, it's things like, do they have a prolonged headache? Do they have previous uh, prolonged concussion? And then there are a few physical exam features. Um, I can't say I have them in my mind quite yet. Yeah. I'll keep that one in mind. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. 
So, um, first of all, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the members of the audience whose hard work and scholarship contributed to some of the articles that we talked about today. I think it's really critically important that this work go on to advance the practice of emergency medicine, especially in those spaces that are rapidly evolving. So thank you so much for not only your hard work and the work of your teams, but allowing us to present your work uh, today. If I can add one more comment, if I add one more comment. Um, with regards to uh, patients who are anticoagulants, so that, uh, Dr. Graywell is here, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you followed up that initial study with another thing that for delayed intracerebral hemorrhage, again, the only anticoagulant risk is warfarin, and all the other ones were still safe. Now, was that initially after first CT, after discharge? So CT clean first, 30 days later, the, again, warfarin was the only offending agent, is that correct? 90 days? Yeah, okay. So that's, that's again, really important uh, takeaways that after initial EDCT, if you've done it, uh, for delayed intracerebral hemorrhage up to 90 days, again, warfarin is the only one you have to worry about. The other ones you don't. So uh, useful follow-up information as well. Yeah, I think, that was a, I think that was a piece of information where the phones came out to take a picture of that slide, perhaps to show to an internist or radiologist uh, at some point in the future. So, but, but thank you very much, and, and thank you to the panel. Mm -hmm.